Imagine you are 20 years old, and there's a revolution in your country, a successful one. A corrupt president who had been seen as a powerful force is not as powerful as many people thought. After weeks of protests, he is forced to leave the country and is not a threat to anyone anymore. This is what I experienced in my home country of Kyrgyzstan back in 2005, when we ousted our first president, Askar Akayev. That revolution made us very brave. You know, when you see that evil forces are not as scary as they try to look, anything seems possible to you. And those were the circumstances in which me and my friend Renat decided to start our own media organization called CLOP. CLOP was very unusual from the very beginning. We started our own journalism school, and we would teach people, sometimes as young as 15 years old. They published their stories on our website, and more importantly, they wrote about politics, human rights, corruption, social problems, you know, really serious stories. But the first revolution did not bring the changes that we hoped for. The second president, Kurmanbek Bakiev, repeated most of the mistakes of his predecessor. And by early 2010, his family members occupied some of the key positions in the government, in security services, in organized crime, and in business structures. And that was also the period when we received our first threat. A person affiliated with uh, security services of Kyrgyzstan, which formerly were known as KGB, by the way, uh, met with me and Renat and started telling us in all the details about another Kyrgyz journalist who had been murdered just two months earlier. And then this KGB person added that we might follow the same fate if we continue writing about the president and his family. We were terrified. But being raised by the spirit of the first revolution, we could not let ourselves give up. And at the same time, protests against Bakiev were now growing and spraying all around Kyrgyzstan. And Klopp suddenly found itself in a totally new position. We became one of the few trustworthy sources of information for all the online users in Kyrgyzstan. Just in three years, we grew from a student project into one of the leading news outlets in our country. President Bakif was overthrown too. You know, we are quite good at overthrowing presidents in our country. <laughs> well, and it's... Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah. And you know, imagine how this was inspiring, especially considering that his tactics against the opposition and the free media were even more brutal than during the times of the first president. And Klopp has grown into one of the largest media organizations in Kyrgyzstan today. Uh, we have more than 60 employees. Uh, we publish news, investigations, videos. Uh, we observe elections, we make software. Thousands of people went through our various courses during the 15 years of our existence. And I can go on telling you about Kyrgyzstan and Klopp for hours, believe me. <laughs> and however interesting it might be, you might secretly ask yourself in the end, so what? <laughs> Why should I care, really? How important is Kyrgyzstan after all? You know, such a small, landlocked, poor country somewhere in Central Asia with almost zero influence on global politics. Uh, heavily dependent economically on its former colonial metropolis, Russia. But let me tell you a story. So in 2019, uh, Klopp joined a group of media organizations who investigated the smuggling of goods from China to Central Asia, and Kyrgyzstan was a key part of the scheme. And uh, we told a story about a Chinese family clan that transported goods through Kyrgyzstan without paying all the necessary taxes and tariffs. And to be able to do that, they bribed the Kyrgyzstan's custom service. And a significant portion of the bribe went to Reimbek Matreimov. Remember this name because I will mention him several times during my presentation. Uh, he was the deputy head of Kyrgyzstan's customs from 2015 till 2017. Our investigation revealed, first of all, the existence of the scheme itself, uh, but also it showed how the top level of our government was poisoned with corruption and what an important revelation it was. After we published the first part of the investigation, uh, people in Kyrgyzstan protested. It was in the late 2019, 
And in 2020, even larger protests happened when Matreimov's party was elected into the parliament. So as a result of these large protests, uh, parliament election results were annulled, and Matreimov's party didn't make it into the parliament. Still sounds like a local story, doesn't it? <laughs> but no, it was not. And this is something that I want everybody to understand. There are no more local stories about organized crime and corruption in our globalized world. Yes, for people in Kyrgyzstan, of course, a story of a local government official who is corrupt was the most important one. But what about that Chinese family clan? We revealed that they had earned at least $800 million through their operations in Central Asia. And then they would spend this money all around the world. This is the property that they bought. You know, they bought houses in the US, in the UK, in Germany, in the United Arab Emirates. They had a number of companies in Turkey. So Kyrgyzstan is one of those countries where dirty money originates. But where does this money end up being stored or spent? If you live in a rich, prosperous country with a good banking system, <laughs> very well might be that this money ends up in your place. Does anybody live in London here? Raise your hands, actually. Who lives in London? <laughs> Some hands I see, not so many, actually. Um, yeah, so if you live in London, there is a very high probability that within the radius of several kilometers from you, sorry for using kilometers, okay, within the radius of several miles from you, a shady business person from a country like mine bought a new apartment and brought all the worst possible corrupt practices to your kingdom. And you know, if these uh, shady criminals would stick only to the criminal activity and do nothing else, maybe that's not even the worst case scenario. But what if organized crime becomes part of the government itself? Or what if the government starts behaving like the organized crime structure? You know, what if then they try to spread their influence abroad, maybe even to your country? What if they start wars? And don't underestimate the possibility of small, corrupt countries to be involved in the worst crimes. Look at Belarus. It is somewhat similar to Kyrgyzstan in terms of size and also in terms of lack of global attention, especially before 2020. It is also enormously corrupt, you know, with most of the resources in the hands of one person, Alexander Lukashenko. And today the territory of Belarus is used by the Russian army to attack Ukraine and to commit war crimes. I needed to add part about Ukraine because I moved to Ukraine last year, so this is very personal. Could the whole world have stopped Lukashenko with harsher, preemptive sanctions earlier? Maybe. At least we should have tried, I think. Let's come back to Kyrgyzstan. Uh, I mentioned Reimbek Madreimov, this former deputy head of Kyrgyzstan's customs. So what happened to him is, I think, one of the best examples of what should happen to a corrupt official. After those 2020 protests, we had the change of the government again. <laughs> you know, we're very good at changing one bad government with another bad government. But anyway, so um, this new government, however controversial it is, had to do something against Matreimov. Uh, so uh, he was arrested and then he briefly spent some time in prison. But more importantly, he was sanctioned by the US, becoming the first Kyrgyz government official to be sanctioned under the Magnitsky Act. As a result, Matreimov is totally driven out of politics. He's a pariah even within Kyrgyzstan. His party does not even exist anymore. And all the current parties, they try their best, especially before the elections, uh, to prove that they have no links with Matreimov at all, even if they secretly do have these links. So, um, you know, maybe we prevented another dictatorship from being born. Of course, we would never know. But what I know for sure is that Matreimov will definitely not be able to start any war in the coming future, maybe even during his whole lifetime. So what is my call for action today? Please support local journalism. We are very important. We have unique expertise. We start digging into stories about dirty money that then end up being spent all around the world. Please support journalism networks and collaborations. It would be much more difficult for us to publish our groundbreaking investigations if we did not cooperate 
with our amazing partners from organizations like OCCRP or Bellingcat or Radio Liberty, because together we managed to combine resources and also to protect each other. Finally, please do something about organized crime leaders and corrupt officials from all over the world who bring their wealth to your countries. If you're a journalist, investigate it. If you're a politician or an activist, demand better transparency and better due diligence. If you are from law enforcement, please arrest them, or at least their assets. You know, because networks of organized crime leaders and corrupt politicians are strong uh, because they can efficiently cooperate across borders. But let us use this power too. Let us build even stronger networks of local journalists, politicians, activists, bankers, because by fighting local smugglers and thieves, today we prevent the world from the dictators and warmongers of tomorrow. Thank you.